I want to say hello to everyone across our locations. I want to give a special shout out to those of you that are joining us at church online. It's great to have you with us today. If you're new or you're visiting with us today at C3, we are in the middle of a teaching series called The Book That Changed the World. And we're taking a journey from Genesis to Revelation. We're taking an overview of the Bible, looking at some of its key themes and main points. And in the time that we have together today, we're turning our attention to a section of the Bible known as the Wisdom Books. Now, as we prepared this series, we drew on some material by an American pastor named James Emery White. And if you want to follow along with my preach today, you can do so using the YouVersion Bible app. But the Wisdom Books. The Wisdom Books get their name because they reveal the collective wisdom of generations of godly people. And they span quite some time period, over a thousand years. I wonder, is there anyone listening to me today? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Someone's listening, that's good. And you want some wisdom in your life. How about I say it like this? Anyone having listened to me today, do you want to go and make one of the worst decisions of your entire life? Do you want to look back on that decision and regret it forever? No, none of us want to do that right. Because I think we all want to discover the answer to the question, what is the wise thing to do? Life throws up lots of questions. Questions like, how should I best parent my kids? Should I take this job, or should I stay in my current job? Shall I buy this new item? Can I afford it? Lots of questions in life. You know what, the very best question we can seek to answer is this question, what is the wise thing to do? Because if we discover the wise thing to do, it helps us answer all of life's other questions. You know, wisdom is key to avoiding regret. The reality is, we all have some regrets. It's not that we woke up one day and we thought, hmm, I want to go and make some bad decisions today. But we do. We have some regrets. I remember when I was in my mid-teens, we'd gone on a family day out to a little, a little harbour town just south of Dublin. And we'd had a day out there, the harbour town's called Hoth. Had a day out there, had some fish and chips. And then we were going on this walk. You can walk right out along the harbour wall. And we'd walked all the way out, we'd turned to come back. And I was a teenager, and I was getting a bit fed up of this walk, and so I was just like, I just want to get back to the car. I want to get home now. I want to have some dinner. And so I was striding it back. I was this tall when I was 14, so I set off at a pace back to the car. And in the distance, I spotted some bollards. And these were the bollards that are linked together with that chain link. So I looked at that, and I made a quick mathematical calculation in my mind. I thought, hmm. If I just cut my gait slightly, I can stride straight over the center of that chain link without slowing down at all. How many of you listening think that was a good decision? <laughs> Not so much. I had a trip to a and &E. I had a locked up elbow with a really painful stress fracture and a few months away from my beloved sports at the beginning of the summer to consider, was that a good decision? If only I had had some more wisdom. If only I'd had some more wisdom, I would have seen that I had so, so much to lose and so, so, so little to gain. Oh, some wisdom would have helped me avoid regret. And it's a silly example, I know that. But there's other examples in my life which I maybe don't feel so comfortable sharing about from a stage on a Sunday morning. And before you go all silent on me, that's probably true in your life as well. Wisdom is key to avoiding regret. And I think this is what the Apostle Paul was getting at in Ephesians chapter 5. Because in verse 15, he says this to them. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. He's saying to them, don't live as unwise. Don't live foolishly, but live wisely. 
then you'll be able to make the most of every opportunity that God has given you. So the benefits of wisdom seem really apparent. So how do we go about getting some more wisdom in our lives? That's the great thing about the Word of God. It is full of wisdom for living, and none more so than the next five books that we're going to explore together. Because today we're going to turn our attention to Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. And to take a look at what God is saying, some wisdom for living through the wisdom books. So let's start off in the book of Job. Job reveals to us a wise response to suffering. The book is set in the land of Uz, which is far away from Israel. And we don't know the author of the book of Job. It may be Job himself. But what we can tell when we look at the book of Job is that it's an incredibly old book. When you look at the way it's written and the descriptions that are used, we can tell that it's an incredibly old book. You see, when you look at your Bible, the order in which the books are put in your Bible doesn't reflect necessarily the order in which things happened. So Job is actually living at the same time as some of the patriarchs, people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was the time period when Job was alive. And the book opens up by painting this picture of a court scene. It's God holding court in the heavens. And in this court scene, you've got God, you've got the angels, and you've got Satan, the accuser. And this whole court scene causes some people to stop and question, well, is this a real story or is this a morality tale? And the author has allowed this to be unclear so that we can fully focus on the questions that Job throws up. And it throws up some big questions. Into this court scene, God opens up proceedings. And he says to Satan, he says, Have you considered my servant Job? Job is a good guy. He loves me. He honors me. He is for me. We have a relationship, me and Job. And Satan's like, hmm, don't know. And this is his response in Job 1, verse 9. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread out throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So what Satan is saying, he's saying, no, nah, there's not really any real love or relationship there. Because, you know, Job, God, he, he's only in it for what he can get from you. You keep blessing him, so of course he loves you. But you take all that away, and he won't just, you know, go a bit cold on you. He'll actually curse you to your face. And God says, no, 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 that's not true. Me and Job have a relationship. Job really loves me. And they make this strange sort of bet. God says, to say, and you can take away everything that Job has, but you must leave him alive. And so Job loses everything, one after another. He loses his wealth, which is contained in his herds. He loses his property. He loses his children. They die. Job's lost everything. And then he develops this incredibly painful body source. Job is in a real state. And so bad is Job's situation his wife comes to him and says, Job, you should just curse God and die. But Job refuses. And onto the scene appear Job's three friends. And they sit in silence. And all of a sudden, Job says, Why? Why has this happened to me? Why? And one by one, Job's friends attempt to answer his question. And Job's three friends are all operating from the same assumption, that good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. So they say to Job, well, Job, God is just and righteous, so you must have sinned, and God is punishing you. And they even go as far as suggesting sins they think Job might have possibly committed. And Job's like, no, that's not true. That is not right. I have not done what you suggest. I know I'm not perfect, but I've tried to live right and honor God. This is not fair. And it culminates with Job turning to God and saying, this isn't fair. 
Why has this happened to me? God, I challenge you, why? And God responds to Job. He doesn't directly answer Job's question. But instead, he says to Job, I have a question for you. Do you fully understand everything that happens in the world? Did you create it? Could you even begin to sustain it? Job, could you execute what you see as justice in the world? And God goes on to reveal more and more of himself to Job. And Job, as he sees God revealing more of himself, takes a step back and says, No, I don't understand everything, God. I couldn't sustain it. I didn't create it. And I choose that while there's things I don't understand, to trust in your goodness and that you are just. Oh, I want to speak to someone today. And you're not even sure how you ended up in church, or you're not even sure how you ended up clicking on this message online. But your life is full of pain right now. There's stuff going on, and you just feel like you want to say to God, Why? Why is this happening to me? Maybe you've just lost a loved one. Maybe a sickness has returned that you thought you'd beat. Maybe something's happened to one of your dearly loved children. And you just want to say to God, why? Why has this happened? This doesn't seem fair. And you might think, oh, well, John, what do you know about my situation? You can't possibly understand how I feel today. And I don't. But this guy, Job, he does. And what Job shows us is some wisdom in terms of our response to suffering. I want to encourage you, if you're in that position and you think when you look at your situation and the pain that you're going through, and then you look at God and Him being just and righteous and you just can't square the two, and you're thinking, the only option is for me to walk away, I want to encourage you, there's another response. Not to walk away, but to wrestle. See, that's what the book of Job shows us. That was Job's response. You see, at no point does God condemn Job for going to him and saying, why? At no point does God say, how dare you ask me why? He actually condemns Job's three friends. He says, you guys, you had a bad understanding of me and my nature. He says, Job, you did the right thing. I want to encourage you, if you find yourself in that season, it's okay to go to God with your why. He can cope with that. And then I want to encourage you to wrestle. Oh, to wrestle, that is what Job chose to do. On the one hand, he had what he trusted about God's nature, and on the other hand, he had what he was going through, the pain, his situation, his suffering, and he wrestled. You know, I don't know a lot about wrestling, but I do know this. You can't wrestle without contact. I want to tell you this, in the midst of your pain, and your suffering, and your why, God doesn't want to lose contact with you. Yeah. Psalm 23 doesn't say, God will leave me to walk through the valley of shadow death on my own. He says, though I walk through the shadow of death, you are with me. And in the middle of your pain, in the middle of your suffering, can I just plead with you, don't let go of God's hand. If all you can do is wrestle, wrestle. But don't let go of God's hand. He is passionate about you. He wants a relationship with you. And he wants to walk with you in the middle of your pain. See, what the book of Job shows to us is that there's more going on than what we can currently see. There's an adversary. There's Satan. Not here to big him up, but he's in existence. And the world we live in right now is not designed to prevent pain and suffering. And it won't be until Christ returns again. At the end of the story of Job... God restores all that Job has twice over. And that's not because God's trying to reward Job, but it's just God's nature. He's saying, Job, 
even in this world that I created and sustained, that I oversee so much, I still see you. I care about you, and my heart is to be generous towards you. I think sometimes we think, oh, Job's story ends really happily. No more whys in the question in the life of Job. But Job still lost his first seven children just because he has another 14, which was a great blessing to him. I believe forever Job had to wrestle with the question of why, but he chose in the midst of his why that he was going to walk with God, that he was going to allow God to walk with him in the middle of his pain. And then we come to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is a collection of songs, prayers, and poems by multiple authors. The majority of them are written by King David, who we spoke about last week. And while it might look like on the outside that this is just this jumbled collection of these prayers, these poems just being thrown in together, there is actually a structure into the way in which they were assembled. And it's there to show us something. Because together with an introduction and a conclusion, there are actually five books within the book of Psalms. And depending how you're reading Psalms, you might even see that notated at the start of certain chapters throughout the book of Psalms. And these five chapters show us two reoccurring themes that go right the way through the book of Psalms. And they're introduced to us in Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. So Psalm 1 is all about, don't walk in the way of the wicked, but honor God's teaching. And Psalm 2 is all about the coming of the Messianic King. Peter, in Acts chapter 4, actually quotes part of Psalm 2. So there's these two themes running throughout Psalms. There's this continual looking back to God's covenant promise and living according to his teaching and looking forward to the coming of the Messiah and expectant of the hope that's found in him. That goes right the way through the book of Psalms. And I think Psalm shows us a wise response to life. Because how wise is that? That we would be people who remember God's promises. That commit that we're going to be people who live according to his teaching. That we are thankful that Christ came and are expectant that he is coming again. I believe that is a wise response for us to life. One of the things I so love about the book of Psalms is the way they give us a real insight into the writer's personal relationship with God. They really give us this window. There's psalms of lament, there's psalms of praise, there's psalms where the writer's experiencing elation, things have just gone well, God has broken through. And then there's psalms where they're like, God, what's going on? I don't understand. And how true is that of life? Sometimes there's great highs and sometimes there is great lows. Sometimes there's moments where we're like, God, what is going on? Life just feels like it's a bit rough. You might even get to the stage where you think, God, are you even still there? Okay, let me try this side. I think this is where the real people sit. (laughs) You get to the stage where you're like, God, are you even still there? Because this is what Psalm 13 says. You know, David, don't go all silent on me because this is what David said. And if you're having things in your life, You identify with King David, Psalm 13, verse 1. He says this. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have sorrow in my heart? How long? So what is a wise response to life? Well, David sums it up at the end of this chapter. Because he doesn't finish there, he finishes like this. He says, but I will trust in your unfailing love. And he goes on to say, I will sing sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. What is a wise response to life? What am I saying? A wise response to life is to praise God. When things are going great, when you're celebrating, praise God. When things are bang average, praise God. When things don't feel like they can get any worse, praise God. You know what? Our response to the highs is as important as our response to the lows. Because when things are going absolutely great, you know what the danger is? We think, hey, I got here on my own. I don't need God. Oh, I don't need to reach out to God in prayer. I'll just keep going. I'm steaming along nicely on my own steam. But that is as dangerous as our response to the lows, because in the highs and the lows, our response should be to praise God. 
I want to encourage you to be people that use the Psalms. It's okay to do that. They are written as songs. They are to be sung. They are to be declared. Maybe you're struggling in your prayer life. How about praying some psalms? Sing some psalms. You might not want to hear me sing my psalms, but (laughs) sing some psalms. I want to encourage you, use them. That's what they were designed for because it says in Psalm 119 that God is faithful to all generations. And that is what the psalms are there to remind us of God's faithfulness. Use the psalms. Then we come to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is this collection of short wisdom. And the majority of the Proverbs were written by King Solomon. And it shows us like bite-sized wisdom. It's a little bit like reading Solomon's like daily inspirations on Instagram. It's short, you can get hold of it super quick. And to understand the Proverbs and to see their full impact, it's good for us to know where Solomon's wisdom comes from. Was it just that he had a few ideas that he wanted us to know? No, Solomon's wisdom came from God. And the defining moment in Solomon's life comes in 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Because as Elspeth said last week, after a little bit of argy-bargy, Solomon has become king. And God says to Solomon, I will give you one request. What do you want from me? And this is what Solomon asks for. He says, give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people. He goes on and says, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? And God says to Solomon, because you asked for wisdom and you didn't ask me to kill all your enemies, you didn't ask me that you would live a long life, that you didn't ask me that you'd be the richest man on the earth, I will give you wisdom and all these other things as well. So Solomon's wisdom is God-given. And there's a theme that runs right the way through the book of Proverbs. And the theme that runs through the book of Proverbs is of fearing God. It's introduced to us in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now you might be thinking, fear of the Lord. It doesn't seem so congruent with a God you've been telling me about who loves me and wants to have a relationship with me. So what is going on there? It's really important that we understand what it means to fear the Lord. It doesn't mean that we go to God in fear. It's not that we have to go and we're we're cowering and we're shaking as if God is some guy who's super unpredictable and you don't know what side of bed he got out of. And if it was the wrong side, he might just turn around and strike you down before he's even listened to you. That's what, not what fearing God means. Rather, fearing God means to give God the rightful honor and respect that he deserves. It's to acknowledge that God is in authority, that he is all-powerful, that he is just and righteous. It's to go to him with honor and respect. That's what it means to fear God. What Proverbs is really saying then is that if we're going to live wisely, We have to take account of who God is. We have to take account of who God is. That's the whole thing with fearing God. We're taking account of who he is. And the Proverbs are so easy to get hold of. There's so much sort of low-hanging wisdom, if you like. Things that you can take, you can see just wisdom for living, and you can apply it with God's help into your life. I'm going to read you a few standout Proverbs. It's impossible to list a few standout Proverbs, but let's try. Proverbs 16 and 32. Love this one. Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. That's good stuff. Let's have another one. Proverbs 25, verse 17. Don't visit your neighbor too often, or you will wear out your welcome. <laughs> I feel that might be like a word from God for someone who's <laughs> listening today. Oh, we've got time for one more. This is, this is a good one. Proverbs 27, verse 5. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Whew. It's good stuff. I want to encourage you 
to get in the book of Proverbs. It's no surprise that a lot of great spiritual leaders have had a discipline around the book of Proverbs because there is so much wisdom for living in this book. How many chapters, can anyone answer me, how many chapters are in the book of Proverbs? 31. How many days are there in the majority of our calendar months? This makes Proverbs the perfect daily devotional. And I want to encourage you, this is your homework from the wisdom books. One month, one proverb each day. Or I can guarantee you, if you read that, and you ask God to start helping you apply some of the wisdom of what you read, you're going to grow in your wisdom for living. There's my challenge for you. One proverb, one day for a month. I believe you're going to want to keep doing that month after month. Then we come to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is different again. It shows us a wise purpose for living. I wonder, are you one of those people who likes to read the first few pages of a, a book and then try and decide whether it's excited you enough to read the whole thing? If you'd just like to raise your hand, we'll arrange for prayer ministry later. <laughs> if that's you, Ecclesiastes is going to be a little bit of a struggle because it starts off like this. Meaningless, meaningless, <laughs> utterly meaningless. <laughs> Everything is meaningless. I mean, that's going to get you out of bed quicker than your morning cup of coffee. <laughs> but Ecclesiastes is one of those books that you need to read the whole way through to get the full picture of what it's saying. We're not certain who the author is. The book introduces him as the teacher. It's commonly thought that might be King Solomon. But whether or not he wrote this book isn't necessarily important. Because what the teacher is trying to show us is that everything we chase after in life is ultimately empty and worthless. He's like, you can chase after money. You can chase after power. You can chase after position. You can chase after sex. You can chase after authority or drugs or drink or anything you like. But ultimately, it is empty. I wonder, have you ever thought, there must be more to life than this? If you've ever had that thought, you're like the teacher. Because this is what he's saying. He's like, I tried to medicate with all those things. I tried to use them to fill this emptiness inside of me. And some of them felt good for a while, but they all wound up leaving me feeling empty and like they were worthless and thinking there must be more to life than this. And he goes on to illustrate the things he's tried. He says that there's not one pleasure that he refused himself. So he's tried it all and he says, it's meaningless. And just as you think, okay, may as well end the misery and die now, he concludes the book in chapter 12 and says this, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. What's he saying? He's saying, as at the end of it all, all we have is faith in God. You know that term, duty of all mankind, it doesn't quite get across what the original Hebrew is saying. If you look at a literal translation, it simply says, this is all of man, or the whole of man. So if you flip this verse, this chapter, this book around, what Ecclesiastes is saying is that unless you connect in a relationship with God, there will always be a part of you that is empty. There will always be this hole, and you can try to fill it with as many things as you want, but they will always wind up leaving you feel empty and meaningless. Oh, he would illustrate to you that you would have a relationship with God, that that is the thing that gives your life meaning and purpose. You know, purpose for living only comes from connecting in relationship with God and his eternal plan for your life. Yeah. And then we come to the book of Song of Songs. Song of Songs is this erotic love poem. And the unsuspecting reader would be forgiven for thinking, did this end up in the Bible by accident? 
I mean, you know when those scribes were copying? Did they copy in someone's sort of bedtime reading by mistake? <laughs> it's not in there by accident. But it is pretty passionate stuff. It's this really, there's three main characters going on in Song of Songs. You've got the male voice, the female voice, and the friends. And so here's an excerpt from the male voice speaking. It says, your teeth are like a flock of sheep. Just shorn coming up from the washing. Each one has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your breasts are like two fawns. Like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Whew. <laughs> she then decides she's going to step it up a gear in chapter 5. She says this, I have slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking. I have taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I have washed my feet. Must I soil them again? My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I arose to open for my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers flowing with myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened for my beloved. I think we're going to leave the story there. <laughs> I know that some of you are going to be going back to read where that finishes after the service. <laughs> but it's pretty passionate stuff. And throughout the book of Song of Songs, there's this real pictorial language that is being used. But it seems to be working for this couple. It seems to be getting things pretty passionate. So I thought, OK, come on, you've got to bring this into my own marriage. <laughs> so the other day, I wandered up to my wife, Hannah, and I put my arm around her, looked her straight in the eye, and I said, Hannah, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just come up from the washing. Your hair is like a flock of goats coming down Mount Gilead. Your breast, no, let's leave it there. So what is the purpose of Song of Songs if it's not there to give us chat-up lines? Because, spoiler alert, it didn't really do anything for <laughs> Hannah. Guy's got to try, right? Well, it's there to show us the passion and intimacy between two lovers. And this is what the book of Solomon Psalms teaches us. That God doesn't hate sex. Sex is good. God, if everyone's going to get an amen in church, come on. <laughs> Loosen up. God doesn't hate sex. Sex is good. He created it. He designed it. It's not something that's dirty, immoral, impure. It's not just for reproduction, but it's God's gift for intimacy. God gave it as a gift. But it's also powerful. It's God's gift, but it's powerful. You know, in Genesis, it talks about how two become one. So it's not just this fulfilling of an urge or a desire. It's something that's powerful. And Song of Songs give us a wise insight then to sex. Does anyone want some wisdom on sex? You don't seem so sure, but you're going to get it anyway. <laughs> Remember that book that I was encouraging you to read, Proverbs? Here's King Solomon with some wisdom on sex. He says this, Proverbs 6, 27. Can a man scoop fire into his lap? without his clothes being burned? I think we all know the answer to that. It's no. I love a good fire. You know, we have a wood burner at home, and it's one of the primary ways we heat the house during the winter, but it also smells good, looks good. It's a great fire. I love to get that stoked up. But what I don't do is I don't light a fire in the middle of my lounge floor. Because while fire is a gift and it keeps us warm, it's also got the power to burn our house down. I want some wisdom on sex. It's understanding that it's a gift from God, but he also gave us boundaries and a context in which it's right. Because he doesn't want us to get our house metaphorically burnt down. He wants to give us wisdom for living. He doesn't want to see us looking back and saying, oh, I wish I'd known, but he wants to give us wisdom. And this is what the song of song shows us shows us this passionate relationship between these two lovers as it grows, as they build towards its full expression in their marriage. 
another lens we can read Song of Songs through is that there's this picture that runs throughout the Bible of God and his chosen people being a bride and groom. And as we start to read Song of Songs through that lens, oh, we can't help but see how God is so passionate about us, how he wants to have a relationship with us that is intimate, that is personal, that he wants to really get to know us. He doesn't just want us to be aloof, far-off people, but he wants to really know you and have a relationship that is more intimate than the most intense physical relationship that you can have. God wants a relationship with you. He is passionate about you. What does the book of Song of Songs and the entire wisdom book show us? They show us that God is passionate about having a relationship with us. They show us that God wants us to live well. He doesn't want us to have to look back with regret. He wants to give us wisdom. Oh, there's so much. In in Job, that we'd have this wise response to suffering, that we would agree that we're not going to let go of God's hand, but we will hold on to his hand. In Psalms, that we see that a wise response to life is to praise God. In Proverbs, that we have some wisdom for the way we live. In Ecclesiastes, that we see there is a wise purpose for living, and it's only found in having a relationship with God. And in Song of Songs, that God wants to give us wisdom in every area of our life. So we come back to the end, and it goes back to the beginning question. What is the wise thing to do? Well, there's a lot in the Bible that's going to help you make some wise decisions. But you want to know what the real wise thing to do is to walk in relationship with God. That is the wisest thing you can do. That will help answer life's other questions, to walk in relationship with God. And maybe you're listening to me and you've never had a relationship with God. You've never truly connected with Him and made Him your Lord and Savior. Well, in a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. But then to those of you who are in a relationship with God, I want to challenge you with this. Let's grow in our intimacy in our relationship with God. There is more. God wants a deeper relationship. He wants to get to know you better. He wants you to spend time with him. He is passionate about you. Let's not allow that relationship to become cool or give or take or I'll have it when it suits me, but let us be people who are passionately pursuing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I really just feel that I want to give an opportunity for some of you to respond. Maybe if you could just stand as we close. And just to give everyone some privacy, and so this is just a moment between you and God. Maybe when I was talking about Job and I was talking about someone going through a season of pain and suffering and why. And you thought, yeah, that is me. That is exactly where I found myself right now. But as you've listened, you said, you know what, I want to make the commitment that in the midst of all of this, I will not let go of God's hand. In the midst of the questions and the things that I just can't make sense of, I will wrestle, not walk away. I will hold on to God's hand and trust that he is going to walk through the shadow of the valley of death with me. If that's you, I'd love you just to slip your hand up. If it's just you, no one's watching, and I'd love just to pray for you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, Lord Jesus, I thank you in the way that you saw Job. You see these people. I thank you that you see them as individuals. They're not just a number to you. You see their pain. You see their struggle. You see the things that they just can't make sense of in their life right now. I thank you for their commitment. A commitment that says, I want to hold on to your hand, Lord, and I know that you will hold on to theirs. And I pray in the dark moments, the moments where they're struggling to make sense of it all, that they would know you walking so close beside them. 
and Lord, whether or not they ever see the answer as to why. Lord, I pray that you would help them each day to wrestle and not walk away, to stay true to you and hold on to your hand and trust that you are a God who is for them and who loves them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, for those of you that are joining us online, I'm going to hand you back to your service, Pastor. Pastor.